I bet that song sounds familiar, right? Well, how about this one? Jump in, jump out, turn yourself about. Gula Gula Island, the beloved children's television show that aired from 1994 to 1998 on Nickelodeon, transported kids to a vibrant world of music, culture, and life lessons. The show, starring Ron and Natalie Days as a husband and wife duo living on a fictional island, was a beacon of positivity and familial love. However, the tragic passing of James Edward Coleman II, who played the iconic character James on the show in March 2021, paints a stark contrast between the wholesome world of Gullah Gullah Island and the harrowing reality of his life and untimely death. Yes, it appears the very medium that brought fame and fortune to young talents like James Coleman has a darker side, often hidden from the rosy image it projects. Television has the power to entertain, educate, and inspire, but it also has the potential to expose the darker aspects of human nature and sometimes even exploit its own stars. The story of James Edward Coleman II is a tragic example of this duality. Born on June 11, 1984, James Edward Coleman II, who portrayed James on Gullah Gullah Island, was a child star adored by viewers. His on-screen presence captured the hearts of children across the United States during the show's four year run. Tragically, his life took a devastating turn, culminating in his death at the age of 36 due to a heroin overdose in March 2021. Yet amidst the tumultuous lives of many child stars, Gula Gula Island stood out as an island of serenity. The island's residents, Ron and Natalie Days, were not only the show's stars but also its creators. They infused the series with the vibrant culture of the Gula people who reside on the sea islands in South Carolina. The show focused on teaching valuable life lessons, promoting creativity, and emphasizing the importance of family bonds. Recalling the moments of Gula Gula Island, it's impossible not to smile at the heartwarming scenes, catchy songs, and the infectious enthusiasm of the Days family. It was a world where problems were solved through cooperation, imagination, and love. Jump in, jump out. Ron Days, who portrayed the father figure on the show, continued to work in education and cultural preservation. Meanwhile, his wife, Natalie Days, also remained active in the arts, focusing on storytelling and education. The positive influence of the show remained a vital part of their lives, and they carried the Gula Gula spirit into their real-world endeavors. In stark contrast, James Edward Coleman II's life took a very different path. His tragic addiction and untimely death serve as a reminder of the struggles that some child stars face once their time in the spotlight wanes. He joins a list of Nickelodeon's Wonder Kids, whose lives took tumultuous turns after their stardom. This connection leads us to reflect on the controversies that have surrounded Nickelodeon over the years, notably the Dan Schneider controversy, which raises questions about the industry's treatment of its young talents. For years, Dan Schneider was a prominent figure in the world of children's television. His production company, Schneider's Bakery, oversaw iconic Nickelodeon shows like Victorious and iCarly, earning him a reputation akin to TV titan Norman Lear, as reported by the New York Times. However, in March 2018, Schneider's association with Nickelodeon abruptly came to an end, shrouded in allegations of verbal AB and questionable treatment of the young stars who graced his shows. Reports of his temper disrupting work, production delays, ballooning budgets, and complaints of abusive behavior filed by his staff began to circulate, leading to a joint statement with Nickelodeon confirming their parting of ways. Amid these allegations, a particular detail raised eyebrows. Schneider's tweeted photos of the toes of his young female stars. This bizarre behavior added to the growing controversy, which also included claims of yelling, tantrums, and inappropriate requests like shoulder and neck massages to child actors, according to a July 2021 deadline report. Schneider, however, denied any wrongdoing, stating in an interview that he had never made actors uncomfortable. Arthur Gradstein, a writer and producer who had worked with Schneider, shared his experiences, describing Schneider as both generous and validating while being unreasonably demanding, controlling, belittling, and vindictive with a disregard for boundaries or workplace appropriateness. 
In 2022, former Zoe 101 Inches star Alexa Nicholas alleged that Schneider had mandated his presence during her costume fittings, going so far as to request Polaroid photos of her in outfits from the wardrobe artist. Nicholas claimed that these actions ultimately led her to leave the show and were part of her decision to start the Eat Predators movement, dedicated to supporting survivors of child SAB. Another former cast member, Jeanette McCurdy, who starred in iCarly, published a memoir in 2022 titled I'm glad my mom died, in which she recounted serious AB that occurred on Nickelodeon sets. McCurdy's allegations, though not explicitly naming Schneider, pointed to a figure known as the creator and included claims of pressure to drink while underage, inappropriate photos, and declining a $300,000 offer to stay silent about her experiences. I just said, no, it's not happening. That sounds like hush money to me. Not doing it, not taking it. But the troubles in the world of child stars extend beyond Schneider. Many like Orlando Brown, Zac Efron, Drew Barrymore, and Demi Lovato have struggled with substance AB after the end of their successful shows. Efron, despite his early fame and teen idol status, entered rehab in 2013 due to alcohol and substance AB issues. Barrymore, who began her battle with addiction at just 12 years old, entered rehab at 14 and was granted legal emancipation from her parents. Lovato's journey involved drug and alcohol AB, leading to an overdose in 2018, making her one of the most Googled figures of that year. Observing the struggles faced by various child stars who later grappled with substance AB issues, it becomes evident that James Edward Coleman II's situation was not unique. The early exposure to fame during childhood, coupled with the alleged mistreatment that many child stars endured within the industry, likely contributed to his descent into drug addiction after the conclusion of the Gula Gula Island show. For context, the children's show Gula Gula Island ran on Nickelodeon from 1994 through 1998, starring Beaufort locals Natalie and Ron Days, along with their family. Through songs and amp skits, the show exposed the Gullah culture of our beloved sea islands to children across America and was the first cultural children's show of its kind. But here is where it really all began. After several years on the road, the Daisy family yearned for a change. Husband and wife Ron and Natalie Days had adapted their multimedia show Sea Island Montage into a traveling production in 1987, and by 1993 the couple had welcomed one child and were expecting their second. The Daisies enjoyed sharing stories from Gula culture with a wide audience, but the demanding lifestyle was starting to take its toll. I said, wow, man, I don't know if I want to live out of the car doing this, Natalie recalled. There's something else. I don't know what the else is, but there's something else. The couple had been approached by people in the entertainment industry in the past, but these collaborations never gained traction. So when an executive producer from Nickelodeon invited them to dinner, they didn't get their hopes up. We had no expectation anything would come from that, Natalie admitted. Even when a television crew flew to South Carolina to shoot test footage of the family in their home in the Sea Islands, nothing was guaranteed. It wasn't until Gullah Gullah Island premiered on Nick Jr. in 1994 that the Daisies' new lives as television stars became undeniable. Gullah Gullah Island was educational like other preschool shows airing at the time, but its lessons went beyond counting and learning the alphabet. Similar to Sea Island Montage, the series primarily sought to teach audiences about the real culture of the Gullah people, a group of black Americans descended from enslaved Africans brought to the Sea Islands of South Carolina centuries ago. It was unlike any series Nickelodeon or any other American network had ever produced. The concept was a hit with kids and adults. The the series ran for 70 episodes and received numerous awards and nominations. For many children watching Nick Jr. in the 1990s, the show was their introduction to a vibrant culture. For Ron and Natalie Days, it was their life. You see, throughout his career as a writer and performer, Ron Days has been drawn to stories of his heritage. I had an interest in my culture and in my childhood it was not spoken of as Gullah but more of as Sea Island culture," Ron revealed. After graduating from college, Ron became a reporter at the Beaufort Gazette near St. Helena Island, South Carolina, where he was raised. Some of the first features he wrote profiled the community members he knew or knew of growing up. 
When he eventually left the newspaper, the songs, oral histories, and traditions of his home island became the basis for his first book, Reminiscences of Sea Island Heritage. Natalie Days wasn't born into the Gullah Geechee community, but she fell in love with it after meeting her future husband. Originally from upstate New York, she began dating Ron while he was writing his book about the Sea Islands. I was fascinated by it, she said. I was fascinated with how he, being a member of the Gula Geechee community, lived in a place where he could say, my ancestors were here for many, many years. Most of the black folk I knew in upstate New York were sort of Southern expatriates. They moved north with roots in the South, so I couldn't walk over land that I could say my grandmother or my grandfather or my great-grandmother or great-grandparents had walked. Natalie was quick to embrace Ron's heritage. Following their marriage and the publication of Reminiscences of Sea Island Heritage, Legacy of Freedmen on St. Helena Island, they developed a two-person stage act based on oral histories from the book. In the 1980s, they brought their multimedia show on the road, spreading the unique culture across the county through songs and stories. Occasionally, people would approach them with ideas for expanding their reach, like turning it into an off-Broadway production. Then we would never hear from these individuals again, Ron said. Prior to meeting a Nickelodeon producer through a friend, television hadn't even crossed their minds. Maria Perez Brown saw that Ron and Natalie Days were perfect for children's media, even if they didn't yet see it themselves. The executive producer for Nickelodeon was in the Sea Islands working on a film adaptation of a book by local author Gloria Naylor, who happened to be close friends with the Daisies and introduced them. Perez Brown was scouting sites for this movie, and Natalie and I were invited to dinner on the last evening of her weekend visit, Ron said. She said she and her business partner had been developing a program idea about an island. She said in that meeting, perhaps it can be about some enchanted Gula community. The prospect of bringing their work to a television audience was exciting, but the couple remained skeptical. It was nothing we had thought about doing, Ron said. She said when she got back to New York, she'd speak to her business partner, Kathleen Minton, and that they would get in touch with us. And we said, sure. We thought, right. What the Daisies didn't know was that Nickelodeon was preparing to make a big bet on its preschool programming. The channel had been the top name in general children's television for years, outperforming competitors like Cartoon Network and PBS. But while its programming for older kids thrived, its content for younger viewers went largely neglected. Nick Jr. ran every day between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m., the time when most of Nick's core audience was in school. After debuting its first original show for Nick Jr., Eureka's Castle, in 1989, the network relied on imported shows to fill the programming block. It wasn't until March 1994 that the network announced a $30 million investment in original shows for Nick Jr. That amount of money emboldened the company to take risks on new talent and innovative ideas. A few months after their dinner, Perez Brown got in touch with the Daisies about moving forward with a Nick Jr. series based on their stage show. Natalie was nearly nine months pregnant at that point, so instead of flying the Daisies to New York, Nickelodeon's creative team came to them. Perez Brown, Minton, producer Kit Laybourne, and writer Fracaswell Hyman followed them around for several days, seeing how the family's everyday life might translate into a half-hour children's show. Because I was home during the week, I would want to play with our daughter Sarah and push her on the swing. But there were not many fathers home in the community during the day, so other children would come by as well and want me to me play with them," Ron said. Natalie's always been interested in crafting and sewing, and when they came inside, that's what she would be doing. If she could involve the children as she involved Sarah in different projects, she would. Those are the things the creative team saw, and they included them in the story. The Nick executives back in New York loved the videos shot in the Sea Islands. They greenlit Gullah Gullah Island, with Ron and Natalie serving as the show's leads and cultural advisors. By the time my son was five months old, we shot a pilot, and by November of 1994, we were on air, Natalie said. The makers of Gula Gula Island wanted to preserve the feeling captured in that early footage. Many of the story elements were borrowed from the Daisy's real lives. Ron's character, for example, was a newspaper reporter, a nod to his background as a journalist for the Beaufort Gazette. And while their older children on the show were played by actors Vanessa Baden and James Edward Coleman II, their baby son Simeon appeared as himself. Other details were based on the broader Gullah culture. You'll see that we had titles, Mr. Ron and Miss Natalie, and they were saying, oh, we can just call you by your names. Not in our community, you don't. Out of respect, you put a handle on it, Natalie said. 
and the concept of extended family, where there was a niece living with the family and the grandparents would show up, that's very true to culture. Parts of Gula Gula Island were filmed on location in Beaufort, South Carolina, and the crew found inspiration all around them. We introduced the production crew to members of the St. Helena Island community, Gula Geechee people, our way of speech, and the different kinds of crafts and different kinds of businesses, Ron said. On each episode of Gula Gula Island, we would go out into the Gula Gula Island community, which was more or less in or around St. Helena Island, South Carolina, so it was an exposure to a real culture and a real people, and this was new. It was quite novel. The production team were so willing and open to work with us in our own community, Natalie said. Some community members introduced to the crew even became characters on the show, like Mr. Bradley, who lived next door to my husband and really was a shrimper, and Ranger Mike, who really was the park ranger, representing the Gullah people respectfully and creating engaging content for young viewers was a careful balancing act. It was always designed to be a preschool show, and it was to impact young viewers in a way that made learning enjoyable to them, Ron said but we tried to make sure that what we showed them was authentic and a presentation of the culture because it was a real culture. By adding musical numbers, a simple story structure, and a colorful puppet, the team was able to present the real stories at the heart of Gula Gula Island in a way that connected to children. Ron and Natalie saw the impact of Gula Gula Island shortly after it premiered. Whether they were from the Gula community or not, many black children watching Nick Jr. in the 1990s saw themselves in Gula Gula Island. Ron said he still receives messages from fans telling him what that representation meant to them. They want to inform us that it was so important to them to see images of people who look like them, or people in their family, or those who got around in their community. The show aired its final episode in 1998, but the Daisy's creative pursuits didn't stop there. Ron continues to write books and make music, and Natalie makes visual art and gives talks on community and creativity. Their Gula background is still a major theme of their work today, but the way the culture is perceived, both within the community and outside of it, has changed a lot since they met decades ago. That's partly due to the impact of Gula Gula Island. I don't know how much of an impact we had on the embrace of Gula culture, but I know when we first started, a lot of people were still embarrassed to say that they were Gula or wouldn't claim that they were, Natalie said. And I see so many people who are so proud and moving forward in terms of the preservation, the evolution of Gula Geechee culture. And I do think we had something to do with that. We took something that a lot of people didn't know about and put it on this huge, huge stage. In any case, despite the tragedy that finally fell on the Gullah Gullah cast in 2021, this show still remains as a core memory of most of our childhoods. One fan commented on this saying, I used to be so in love with this show, I can still remember watching it when I came home from preschool. Anyway, that's it for this video folks, bye!